Good morning. So let's go ahead and get started again. Please sign in if you haven't already done that. Our main focus today is going to be on supporting people with applications. And so these are primarily the tips today are coming directly from uh, the data that ISBE is, is getting. And we want to make this process as easy as possible. Uh, I know that both Heather, as, as she'll talk about momentarily in the agency, um, is finding that most of these things are, um, are, are twofold and that they're requiring a little bit more, being a little bit more explicit in, in what we're sharing out. But that probably also has a secondary benefit of for our next go round of actually doing st certain things with students for next year. Um, it, it's one of those where it, it helps you sharpen your focus a little bit instructionally as well. And we're certainly finding the same things as we've been able to have conversations with people. So we are going, to, we have a bunch of quick announcements for you. You've got all of these with all these links in the slides. We will, uh, one of the members of our team will drop the link to the slides into the chat again here uh, momentarily. And then we're going to dive into those application uh, tips really that we've, uh, that the agency has been finding. What we'll do there is I'll kind of walk us through those initially, and then Heather's the one who'll really expand on, on what she's seeing and what's helping people um, and so forth. So with that said, um, first of all, um, Heather, do you want to jump in on this one? Sure, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would appreciate if the applications for those of you who plan to issue a pathway endorsement for the class of 2023, get those in for the review by uh, March 24th, um, sooner the better, as Jason put in this slide. Uh, as always, reach out for support. I have had some um, districts that have <laughs> said, hey, can you go in there and look before I fill out that form saying that I'm ready for review? Um, and that's absolutely fine. I, I will try to get, get that done as soon as I can. Uh, the time frame of March 24th allows time that we can have those conversations if there are some um, revisions that need to be made to certain sections. Um, but I think that that is, is, a, is a healthy timeline for us to have so that we can make sure. Um, and it set, certainly sets us up for our next uh, meeting that we have when we talk about um, that topic, which Jason will get to. Um, so I just, March 24th is, is the deadline to get those in for 2023. And again, the idea there is that then if there's time needed for a revision that can be done. And, and again, as many districts have found out over the last week, the sooner the better so that um, you can work directly with Heather to make any modifications. And hopefully what we'll do today will help you relook at, at stuff that may have been returned and been like, oh, wait, okay, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this, we can make those changes this afternoon and then resubmit to ISBE as early as this afternoon. Um, wanted to let you know, got an excited call from Heather um, just yesterday, actually, uh, who shared that the Heather has been meeting with the IWAS team. I think we've talked about that here before on a weekly basis. Um, they may be on track. Uh, we don't want to, I, coming from a, an, an ed tech background in a couple school districts, uh, I don't want to make any promises about timelines, but they may be on track to have the IWAS form kind of ready to go for the start of the school year. So given that, if you are not looking to have endorsements earned uh, for students that are juniors or younger, current 11th graders or younger, we're making the recommendation that you won't even have to deal, hopefully, with the current system at all. Now, you can if you want to. You can go ahead and put stuff in there. As you know, Heather is prioritizing applications for students in the class of 2023 right now, but then she'll come back to those for the class of 2024 and beyond. And so that's no problem. You can absolutely do that. But if you're like, you know, I'd rather just learn this new and our first students that we anticipate earning endorsements are our current 10th graders, class of 2025. Great. I would say sit tight a little bit longer. Keep attending stuff. Keep learning the, the content details here so that your work is really high quality and sales right through. But um, certainly think that the, the bits and pieces I'm hearing and Heather can certainly weigh in here 
um, it'll be a lot more clear, like, here's a question, just answer this question. Here's a question, just answer this question. And all of those things, again, really just are, are in alignment with what's written into, into the different versions of the post-secondary and workforce readiness act. Um, class of 24, you can keep moving forward, but again, Joe, our, our suggestion here, my, my personal suggestion is if you haven't been yet in the current system or, or not deeply, this gives you an out to wait and get approved early next fall and just have everything in IWAS straight away and never have to, to deal with the PWR system and then the transition to the IWAS system. And again, let me just say as an outsider of the agency with you know my school district background, my ed tech background, my uploads to ISBE background. Yeah, of course, it would have been better if, if this was all in IWAS four years ago. Let's just, let's just acknowledge that. Um, it wasn't, and so so yeah, these transitions are hard. And the fewer people have to transition, probably the better for everybody too. If you have individual questions about that, um, I'm happy to give unofficial advice to that. And obviously, Heather, you can reach out to Heather directly on that too. So, um, so I, I as I have assumed all along, uh, you will have to re-enter your form. Um, but it, it should then be approved if all the content is the same, but there will be copying and pasting. And um, I've had to lead school districts through that. It's miserable. Um, the fields don't match up. Um, obviously there was a whole new law written in between when the system that we're currently using was created uh, and, and where we are today. And that has some impact on this. And so, yes, there will be some work to do. Um, and I know the agency has already started kicking around ideas about how to try and make that work easier, incentivize people. Um, but our, our team will certainly try and come up with creative ideas to help. Go ahead, Heather, sorry. I will say to Christine's question, um, there you will not have to reapply. Um, as this is, is set up, we will give access to those who currently have, um, have turned in their applications um, it's going to look a little different as far as who gets access once we get to the, the timeline of, of 2025, because that's when you would have to make that decision to opt out. So at that point, really anyone who hasn't already applied and said that they plan to issue endorsements will have to get access within the Iowa system because the opt out um, will be built into the system as well. Yeah, and the other thing I think will happen is all superintendents will just have to select it for access, and then they'll yeah. have to they'll have to assign it to other people in the district. Um, Correct. So that that whole process is way more streamlined than I was as part of just the infrastructure. Yeah. So again, the the one thing we're calling out here is this work is continuing and accelerating, and so if you. Uh, either don't have any endorsements for this current group of seniors or or for new ones you might be adding in the future, um, we just wanted to throw it out there that you may want to wait um, to just put those in on the other side of summer, but keep building your content. Keep doing that in Google Docs or Microsoft 365 or whatever you use. Um, you don't stop the work internally. Um, we've got this slide in here, the ISBE office hours. Um, that, that link is, is there to the College and Career Pathway endorsement page. We do still have more professional learning events for this year. We've actually added some additional ones recently for this spring. So be sure to check those out between now and the end of May. And then our summer professional learning calendar has, has been up for a few weeks now, um, almost a month actually. And so lots of stuff there, including team-based challenge in-person workshops uh, around the state geographically um, and we are locking in those specific locations. Uh, literally, as we speak, we met about it yesterday. We actually have many of them locked in and we'll be adding those to the calendar. And we're hoping to have uh, approximately 80 to 100 people at each one. And so it's, it's up to everybody to just one morning, three hours of like blitzing through trying to, to get a first team-based challenge written, which again, if, if they're CTE teachers, uh, in many cases, it's not going to be a big stretch to take something they've already done and add some key components to it um, and, and have it meet those team-based challenge needs. Uh, we Last night, when I last checked, we had about 220 people signed up. Uh, we've got room for 300. 
We are through the Illinois P20 network hosting an informational webinar, much like the HLC one that Rodrigo and Amy uh, hosted a month ago uh, about HLC proposed changes that could have a significant impact on dual credit. We're hosting an updated webinar in the new PACE frameworks. Um, we will share both the updated high school and the new sixth through eighth grade middle school PACE frameworks that are a result of HB 3296 at that time. Um, and most importantly, um, there's the, we are in a period of public comment. So there's feedback and you, you don't need to attend the webinar to give feedback. Um, that is available on, um, on the ISB webpage. Um, you can find that and that public comment period goes through March 21st. But we do think that this webinar will um, help prepare people for that. We specifically want to target middle school folks, um, particularly people in elementary districts who haven't had a lot of contact with the PWR Act at all since its inception. So if you're in a high school district that has sender elementary districts, please get this out to them. Um, and depending on what happens with numbers, we may be sending out emails to some of you who are registered and have five to eight people from your district registered and saying, hey, can some of you watch this together? We will be recording this and hopefully uh, posting it right after school on Monday to still give districts as much time as possible uh, to watch it who weren't able to attend and uh, provide feedback to the agencies. And the agencies are definitely looking for feedback, particularly to make sure that this middle school one is, is really actionable uh, for middle schools, uh, both teachers and district level curriculum, student services folks, et cetera. Um, the career pathway competencies, we sent an email out. These are now posted on the, um, on the ISB College and Career Pathway Endorsement website. This big picture is a link to that page. You can also just go to isb.net and search College and Career Pathway Endorsement, and the competencies are in their own tab here, um, just below the news and updates. And so you've got all seven technical competencies for each career pathway area, as well as the cross-sector essential employability competencies. So uh, be aware of that, um, share those links out with teachers in your district, et cetera. Whoops, I went too fast. Okay, so um, can I ask a question about that? Please go for it, yeah. Uh, what, do you, what does ISB recommend? in terms of how folks should use those competencies in the formulation of their pathways or pathway endorsements, or are they just kind of reference points for teachers developing curriculum, work-based learning experiences, things of that nature? Are they like required as a part of the application process? So, the, so, they, so for example, yes, for within your team-based challenges, uh, you need to have at least one essential skill and one uh, technical competency that you're assessing on those, for example. And then I think Juan Jose's last point, though, is really the big reason. And, and the conversations I've had with many of you on this call, you're already doing this with these. Um, and that's for general curriculum work and how you're building that. And we know there's some really exciting things happening with districts looking at those um, and, and both the technical competencies and the essential skills and where they fit in general curriculum design processes. And so Juan Jose, my answer to your question would be actually probably the most uh, frequently needed reason for them out there is that general curriculum work that districts are already undertaking. Um, but they're certainly a, a resource. They're also a resource as you're building out what is, how are you assessing um, students' progress with your business partners um, and community partners in their internships, for example. And we know we've heard of many districts that are using those to talk with business and community partners about what their priorities are for students um, in, their, uh, in their internship experiences, for example. So uh, I hope that answers that question. Um, but yeah, we're just happy to have, have that resource out. Great job to all of those committees that uh, were put together a number of years ago now to, to get those done. Um, we also, just as a reminder, this is a link to the word marks. If you have an internal use for these in your district, um, you can click the Career Pathway Word Marks link and you can, you can download these and, and use these as you see fit. This is one of those things, almost like what Juan Jose was just asking about. Please share via the user group um, how you're using these. Um, do not be shy about that. And with that said, um, this is the email address you do need to send emails to if you want to send a question, a comment, something you want to share to the user group. 
Uh, do check your spam and junk. If you, you should only have to mark it once or twice that, to not be spam or junk and you should be good. And again, please do not be shy um, for, again, I'm gonna call back the last part of what, what Juan Jose was just asking about, but that again, we all know, including Juan Jose, the districts are doing that work. Share those things that you're doing. Um, don't just wait to be tapped on the shoulder to present in a user group meeting or at a conference like the Success Network hosted the other day. Um, just send an email to the group. Uh, lastly, very exciting announcement. Uh, we have a third episode that'll will go up shortly, but we have a new season of Career Pathways Virtual Trailheads that is underway. Um, Shavina has been recording new episodes. Um, I she recorded another one this week. So not only will there be a third episode, there'll be a fourth episode. Um, so there's a couple of new ones uh, posted. Uh, we will get the third one up this weekend. That is my fault. That is a uh, week overdue, um, but uh, we're excited to get that up. It is a it is a it is a very cool one. Do you have some students in your school who are interested in video games? You'll want to check this one out. And so, um, just wanted to call out this resource. It's a great way to uh, within classes, including core content classes, make connections to careers and also to look at the essential skills in, in really some detail as you listen to people. And then lastly, our next meeting is scheduled for April 14th. Um, we do have an agenda here and we've started to talk to, we've got multiple people who will be engaging. The first topic will be how to determine if individual students have earned the endorsement. Um, on April 14th, Heather will be out at a conference. So she's still working through if she's gonna be able to join live or not, and if she's not able to join live, we may have a pre-recorded part that we will share as soon as that's ready for that first bullet, and then we know we will have um, we will have uh, a number of different people talking about how we celebrate students who've earned an endorsement and the ongoing conversation around the currency of endorsements. And so, with all that said, one thing we do want to call out until if we do all of this. This is a meeting that may go beyond 10 o'clock. And so we're not changing that in the calendar right now, but you may want to um, block out from 9 to 1030 in your calendars on April 14th. Speaking of which, for some unknown to us reason, there are only like 13 or 14 people who would appear have this event in their calendar um, out of the 400 of us that are part of this group we will be resending out a new calendar invite that will come from either Bill or myself no later than Monday and maybe today. Uh, we wanted to wait till after today to mention that. So when you get a new invite for nine to 10 a.m. Uh, or, or you don't have one at all, just be aware something that we cannot explain happened with that because a handful of people are in there, um, but hundreds of people are not. So watch for that. So let's go on. Uh, again, the call out that this is about the quality for the kids earning the endorsements, not the quantity and the number of endorsements your district is earning. At the same time, we hope that any number of endorsements helps shift instruction um, for all students to have more opportunities for work-based learning, more counseling around career and, and college, more authentic instruction across both core classes, as well as other classes. I mean, certainly much like the instruction they get in their CTE classes. So we're gonna go in and talk about a few key areas here that have been the, the biggest areas where Heather has um, been noticing patterns in the applications. And we're gonna try and help everybody with those. So for the course descriptions, there's really three elements that need to be in there, the course description, and then an answer to the first question, which focuses on how, how are students learning skills and or content that is needed to be successful in the pathway in this course? And the second question, how does this course help students learn what the actual work is like in the workplace? And sometimes that second one can be tougher to answer, even for courses that we all agree are, are a good course to have in the course sequence. And so we're gonna give you an example of that. So that first example, we'll focus in on this first example first, and we'll, we'll bounce around in the slides a little bit here. This is from medical uh, terminology. This course will develop medical vocabulary through the study of word construction, spelling and pr pun pronunciation, excuse me, I did not pronounce that well, medical abbreviations and symbols, and the use of terminology in correspondence and reports used in the medical profession. 
So like, how is that class? Clearly that class is gonna cover question number one, skills and or content that's needed. Like they have to have the vocabulary. And hopefully you have a course description, either your own from the secondary level, or if you're using, if the dual credit class and you're using the community colleges course description, great. Copy and paste that course description, it, answer how the skills and our content are covered, but then how are students gonna learn what the actual work is like in the workplace from that? Well. Here's, here's our answer, and we'll give you a minute to read this. And then, Heather, if you want to jump in and talk about this, that would be great. What's going on? Jason, is somebody supposed to be talking right now? Nope. Everybody's no. reading the slide <laughs> and then and then Heather's going to jump in. I was just getting ready to jump in. I read through it and, and try to time that. So uh, what I appreciate about appreciate about this example and, and the way that we have this broken up is that it's very clear for the course description and then the answer answers to those two questions. And I can tell you that in the um, as it as it is right now in the design with the new platform, this is how this will be entered, where you have your course description and then you specifically address the first question, the second. So it, it would be beneficial if you want to to break that out in your description within the PWR platform. So um, it just makes it crystal clear. Um, and we we chose the medical terminology because as Jason mentioned. Um, how do you, I know that class, I had multiple students at, <laughs> in Pena that took that class. So how do you uh, apply that to the second question with the actual workplace? Um, so we're hopeful that this example gives you just a little bit more uh, information and shows you some, some ways that you can, you can answer that question. Because as we said, we know, I know that that's happening. We just need to make that clear. And this is uh, important as we start to add in the classes and, and just determine which is appropriate for that course sequence to make sure that we're not just throwing in classes um, and that really it is teaching them that skill set and the workplace um, experiences they would have. One, one thing I want to mention too, there's not only one right answer to these. I mean, I would, right. I was looking at this one, I would change the last sentence. If they are not confident, this class should be a support designed to help them become more confident in using this language in writing and speaking, for example. Like, Either one of those, depending on like, maybe there's a ton of counseling going on at this school that's really exemplary. And so that last sentence makes more sense in that world. Or on the other hand, maybe this is a school where we're, well, and all schools would fall under this one, but where our focus is really on, on helping students, um, again, be confident in places where they're like, ah, should I really be here? And so there's, there's multiple right answers to these questions, but hopefully by having the models, it gets you to, to your right answer. Um, the other thing, I, I did meet with a small group of districts earlier this week, and one of the ahas they came up with actually is um, they were having a conversation about Heather reading these from across dozens and dozens of districts, and they decided um, that, that breaking these up, chunking their answers um, for the course descriptions, for the team-based challenges as, as the the items that need to be answered would probably also make it more likely that Heather wouldn't miss what they were answering about to, to do that. And I know Heather has spent a lot of time reading and rereading ones, but I think that's probably a good idea, um, maybe for, for both sides. So that was a cool idea that came from the field, and you're seeing evidence of that here and how these have been put together. And Jason, as you, as you uh, were going over that first example, um, on, on the slide when it says skills and content, I was actually thinking about like really familiarizing yourself with the essential and technical skills because that could be a call out in there as well. Could be, and that that is not required in the course description, but certainly if your course is focusing on those things, 
that would be a very natural way to, to demonstrate, right, the strong connection between what's being taught in the course and what's required in the field in the pathway. And good, I, and it's I a great example. Seen, that is, that is good. And I have seen that in some of the course descriptions where they've combined that with um, when they address that question. It's, it's a combination of the skills that, like we mentioned here, but then also throwing in some of those technical competencies. So, yes. Yeah. It's great. So let's go back to example two here. Um, uh, again, this this stuck. We stuck with health science and technology here, and so in retrospect, we probably shouldn't have done that. I apologize about that. But you'll see other examples as from other pathways as we move through this this morning. Um, the primary objective of the basic nursing assistant program is to provide students with the hands-on training necessary to offer high-quality care to patients while working alongside other qualified healthcare professionals. Course offerings include training in a nursing home. That should be another sentence, but this was like copied and pasted from something real, as well as courses of study and practice in skills related to patient care. Students divide their time between classroom and laboratory instruction to best equip them to sit for the Illinois Certified Nursing Exam or secure entry-level employment in the healthcare or nursing industry. So the updated version of example two um, is here. And here in this case, a community college course description was taken, it's dual credit class. And then you can see the questions one and questions two. So we'll give everybody a moment to read it and then Heather will jump in. So as you can see, we again put this in the same format with those um, addressing it, and and we put in the the course description for the actual um, the first requirement of the course description. And the example um, that was more of the program, the the description of the program, and not unique to that specific course. So that's how we broke this one out. Um, and you can see we've got the skills as well, and then what they are doing as it relates to the actual workplace. All right. Any questions about courses before we go on to team-based challenges? So again, description, question one, question two. Awesome. All right, team-based challenges. Um, so we obviously, we have on this next slide, the checklist that everybody has, has seen before. Um, and if we go back a slide, this is a, um, a version of, of the checklist that has come directly from, I mean, these were like literally words out of Heather's mouth, capturing um, what, where the issues have been with team-based challenges, um, different things that are missing. So it may be that just one of these is missing or is not clear, you know, the mentors from a company. You don't have to tell us the mentor's name. The, the mentor is, is Jimmy or Francisco or whoever the mentor is, um, but, but the mentor is in this role at this company, uh, goes a lot further, or you know the mentors are mechanical engineers from these three companies. Um, so that's an example of, sometimes it's just being a little bit more specific um, one of the things you may say is, well, we may not know that when we're applying. Well, obviously at this point in the year, if we're applying for class of 2023, and this is a this year issue, then you're right. You, you, this year, you, you probably do know that, but in future years, you may not know that. And so that's something that's probably going to evolve with this. And I'm, I can't speak to that right now, but where the process has been through its first four years, um, with a lot of times the applications um, coming in 
uh, in the in the late winter and early spring for that year's graduating 12th graders, um, we do tend to know even that level of detail. And so, um, so these are really the key things. And, and these are the things you'll want to look at what you've written and say, have we given a clear description of an authentic problem? Not just like, uh, well, well, we'll show you. We'll show you one on that in a minute. Have we said who the ment mentor is and how they're interacting with students? And have we listed what our technical competencies and essential skills are? So again, here's the checklist. If you if you're really sure you've got all these things, you're you're going to be good to go. So example one, we're going to do the same thing here as we just did. In the accounting course, students will collaborate with an adult mentor from the financial community to exhibit their understanding of the accounting cycle by evaluating real life financial statements from an accounting firm. Students will work in teams cooperatively to complete the task and achieve mutual goals. Uh, they will present their findings to the class and the community member will provide feedback on their efforts. So what they're doing is evaluating real life financial statements from an accounting firm. Um, so one of the things we, we looked at on this one is, well, what's the actual problem? And, and so we, we turned it into an actual problem and we looked at who was the financial community, where, what, who in the financial community was coming? Oh, it was accountants from country companies we were working with. So, okay, let's just say that. Um, but then we did change the problem a little bit here. And, and this, this would be a better, this is, this is a better team-based challenge, frankly. So in the accounting course, students are tasked by country companies with creating a more understandable monthly financial statement for their customers. Are students going to have to evaluate all of those first? Absolutely. So we're just making this a higher level next step synthesis and creation uh, requirement for students. Uh, so I'll let you read the rest of this uh, on your own and then Heather will jump in. For those of you who have received the feedback and, and know when I reference the feedback form, um, the I think the two slides before those different components, those are um, laid out in the in the feedback form. So I'm hopeful that if I had to um, say for this one, I know that they did not address the technical competencies or essential skills. So those would be indicated that you need to identify one of those, an easy switch, and, and the, I'm sorry, an easy addition to make for those. Um, and this just provides a, a much more robust example of what it is they're actually going to be doing within that team-based challenge. And I will say one thing that I forgot to add um, in our conversation with that is the, um, the oftentimes it's not clear that it's an actual team-based challenge. So keep that in mind as well. Um, and I think a lot of ones that maybe are, are occurring that are at a classroom level, where even if it's a small class of say 11 students, very easily could be changed into a team-based challenge where they're having those, those uh, you know, working together uniquely um, to come up with different solutions to that problem. So that, that's just some feedback as well that I've, I've been seeing. Any other comments about this one, Heather? Nope. The one other thing I, I want to mention is, again, you'll see how this is broken out. Um, so the technical competencies and the essential skills, you, you saw this in a previous last month in the user group, just separating those out instead of like jamming them into a paragraph can real quickly make this make this easier, more clear for, for the teachers working on this and more clear for Heather to review. Um, and then again, here, you know, describing what the um, what the problem is, what the product is, and what the who the mentor is, and what the interaction looks like. And so, um, hopefully, this kind of example helps. 
So um, going back, oops, I'm in the wrong screen. Um, so I just want to confirm something please. you said in the chat, Jason, which is that a college faculty could be the mentor for a team-based challenge? Yes, yes, they could. Okay. So that's not their normal teacher. That would be- No, I understand. That, uh, yeah, so it's it's not like an articulated credit kind of situation, um, but yeah, sure. I mean, hopefully they're hopefully they're an ex, uh, an expert in the field. And um, well, as the podcast I listened to while I was shoveling today, that college faculty member also uh, has started twenty different businesses in their in the course of their career. So um, depending on the field you're in and who who the the mentors are. Um, they may they may serve multiple functions depending on the team based challenge in terms of their mentorship. Heather, right? Disagree? Comments about that? No, oh, I agree. I agree. I think that the key point there is that um, as you as you put in the response, someone other than the normal classroom teacher. I'm wondering if Amy is um, referencing the fact that if that class is being taught by that community college faculty. So if the students are doing dual credit or not dual credit, dual enrollment, perhaps, if they're taking that at the career center with that, would they count as, as that industry expert? I may be wrong on that, Amy. I don't want to. <laughs> I no, I I appreciate that, Heather. I'm actually just looking for ways to increase the partnership between our community college partner, um, Oakton, okay. and I thought this would be a great way. And when I was at Cassie's regional professional development last Friday, it was brought up and I thought that since we have everyone at the table here today that can say yay or nay, um, might as well throw that question out there to be asked and confirmed. So thank you very okay. much. Okay. Heather, can I have you, before we go on to the second challenge, um, can you talk about, I know this is a question you get asked a lot too, and so it's a great opportunity to get the answer out there kind of the school district application nature of this and what happens when school districts partner with each other, either in an informal way or through some kind of formal mechanism uh, with the question uh, that's asked there and there's a follow-up comment. Oh, from I didn't Carrie see that, that I'm sorry. I'm that's okay, Go. no, 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 no worries. Yep. Oh, okay. So like in an area competition, team-based challenge, yes, they, they each school district would have to enter that information regarding that team-based challenge into their own plan. Um, that's the that's how it's functioning and that will be continue how it's, that will, why I'm not speaking well this morning, I'm sorry. <laughs> that will continue to happen in the new platform as well. Um, it will be at the district level. So that information um, will be unique to that plan. We did have some conversation on as, as you have there where you can search for it, um, but that, that's not going to be feasible for this. Um, so it will be that that team-based challenge would, be need to, would need to be entered for each of those districts. Uh, it can have the same information. And so that can happen together. Obviously you're creating those together and you're making sure that they address the component, but each district would have to upload or put that information in for that career pathway and that team-based challenge. So again, while you're doing the planning, write it up in, in a shared Google Doc or a shared yeah. Word Doc, and then you'll each copy and paste uh, the same text, potentially the exact same text, potentially each district has, has to change one thing. Maybe you each have your own mentor that you're working with, but it's otherwise entirely the same. Then you would just change those few words. So. Um, that's a great question. We want to we want to encourage that kind of partnership. We know that's going to be really important. Um, so, Sarah Jason, real quick, this came in uh, from the chat, and I was going to clarify it too. Is um, Sarah from CPS writes? Do CTSO competitions count as team based challenges? And one question that came up uh, many months ago was, you know, there are a lot of great activities and competitions in these uh, programs. Uh, in, in CTSOs um, that are awesome individual events, but those may have to be modified to meet the requirements for a team-based challenge in order for those to count. And so uh, I just wanted to reiterate that because I think over time, um, we relied heavily on some of those organizations to provide those events and they're great events sometimes, 
for individual students. But the whole point of this work is that students get those essential and technical skills in a team setting, working together, um, doing, the, doing that collaboration work that our employers and community organizations want. So thanks, Bill. I have two two additional things I'll mention about that. Um, in addition to Sarah, yep, here's the list. So it's it's going to be does it meet all of the requirements or not? Um, the two things I want to mention are um, number one, there's in a lot of people's minds, and I I heard this. I was on a phone call with an EFE director uh, yesterday late in the afternoon, and a lot of us go to by default that the challenges are competitions and they do not need to be competitions. Um, they can be, but they do not need to be competitions. And one of the things I would say, particularly if you're hosting a local competition, it uh, is I would I would challenge us to say, does it is is that necessarily uh, best served by being a winner and loser competition, or is it best served by being more like um, the uh, the Illinois Music Educators Solo and Ensemble contest um, method, which is there's a rubric and everybody gets a rating and you're going to get a one, two, or a three. And it's possible that in some region, there's not going to be any ones. Uh, and it's possible in another region that there's going to be a ton of ones. And it's all based on the student performance. So even within competitions, there's a lot of room uh, for thinking about, about that, and about whether or not students have kind of met the bar. The second thing I'll mention is if a competition, to Bill's point, if a, if a CTSO competition is an individual competition, how can you still use that structure to work in a team-based challenge? Well, you can. You can, as the training towards the actual competition, you know, can you locally do a version of that that is a a collaborative one that has a mentor providing kind of that feedback that theoretically, again, just like students preparing for the musical with dress rehearsals or the basketball team, you know, for games, um, that that should allow the students to be more prepared when they when they get to the actual competition. Um, so there's a lot of options, even when a CTSO uh, competition doesn't meet all of these requirements to still leverage that if if you want to do so. Great questions. So let's go on and take a look at example two. Um, so each partner group must design and execute the creation of a 1.4 inch milled product through creativity, collaboration, and compromise. Each pair must determine the part to manufacture, plan the project, program the mill, Troubleshooting their code if errors exist, very important. Manufacture the part and inspect the part specs. This is done with an industry partner providing meaningful feedback. The final product is a 1.4 inch milled product. Students must demonstrate collaboration, independence, teamwork, communication, and perseverance. So this one, um, oops, taking another look at this one. Um, this one uh, with the partnership, and, and one of the things we talk about in our team-based challenge workshops is, is the, the importance of the partnership, the business and community partnership in a perfect world. We won't always achieve this, especially when we're new to this work, but in a perfect world of helping us uh, identify really specific authentic problems. And so here we see in the middle paragraph, um, there is a specific partner um, that is listed here, the day shift manager from Mid-America Metals and Composites. And then we see one of the things you'll notice right away is we don't have a 1.4 inch, we're not using an imperial measurement anymore, and it's not just a product, it is a three centimeter, it's about the same size, milled plug for a machine that manufactures healthcare safety equipment. So it is like an exact idea that came from the actual partner said, well, this is something we actually make, and it would be good to have the students try and make this. You guys could make this at school. You have all the equipment to do that. And so, um, so you see those changes. And then again, you see the technical competencies and essential skills um, listed out. And they were, this was a very specific update uh, that this person would be in class to provide in-person feedback to each group about three days before the plugs are due. Um, so like that's, that's unusually specific. You're not typically probably going to have that, but in this case, that's how, that's how they were written it. And it's certainly meaningful feedback for students to know, oh, we should change this, we should change that, and still have time to do it based on the feedback from the expert. Heather? I think you summed that up nicely. <laughs> that's exactly right for our conversations. Yep, that's, that's it. Okay. 
Um, Post-secondary credentials. Um, so one thing we wanna point out here in the current system, a little kind of thing with the current system, the idea here, the reason this goes out of order is because all of us in the Lincoln Land Community College um, attendance area can use what we do. Uh, we don't all have to, as a matter of fact, we all should not go in and add this. We should check first uh, to see if someone else has already put in the program. Um, that we that we are going to align with. So you first start with the system resources, um, make sure your institution, your partner institution is in there, and then make sure your program is in there. And that's where you would you would add the credentials. Um, and that's both the name of the credential. Uh, this name was taken directly off, as you'll see in a second, uh, the Lincoln Land uh, website and what type of degree it is. And um, and then again, this is where this is what where you go once you're in your career pathway plan. Once that exists in system resources, then you need to just for that specific career pathway endorsement plan, you need to grab that credential and make sure it's there. And so this is what you'll see initially that this is not valid. There's nothing there, and I would click the green button to add it. Um, and again, where is this coming from? It is coming directly from. Uh, the Lincoln Land website. Couple things we want to point out: you do not need to list the SIP codes. And for the Math Gateway and the English Gateway, uh, Heather's updated instructions from the fall um, say NA. You just plug in NA there. Uh, those are not required fields at this point. And again, where do you get this information from? How do you know? Well, hopefully, again, in a perfect world, you're having these conversations. We heard Amy bring this up with your community college partners, with other post-secondary partners does not have to be a community college, um, but in many cases, most cases, I think it is, Heather can verify that. Um, and, and on their website, I mean, this Lincoln Land's website is really good about this. I mean, this is, this is well done with the degrees and certifications right there in a tab with the job outlook and the cost, and then boom, let's get you in here and get you started. Um, but it's very easy to see under the degrees and certifications there were our options as a school district in the attendance area and through the conversations we've had and what dual credit courses we're offering in partnership with Lincoln Land. So that gives you an idea. Heather? Yeah, I would also say that there have been examples that have been turned in or have been submitted that have multiple partners. So um, what I'm seeing too is that maybe one of the post-secondary partners are listed and everything's filled out, and then the second they wanted to add that in, but they're missing some of those credentials. So just keep that in mind. I know that in the, the new platform, you will identify the post-secondary partner. We will actually have a list of those for you that, from a dropdown. Um, so we don't even have to worry about that. And then you would type in the entire thing. So it's not going to be separated out anymore with the program name and the, um, the credential, but you would, for the example of that, that Jason has on the screen, you would type in for what type of credential or a program, you would say uh, computer science and, or an associate's in arts and computer science, something along those lines. So um, that's just some updating. So, and a lot of those um, with the approval, I'm, if, if you've got them listed, then it's a yes, but I may have put a comment in to just, you know, to, to, to um, make those unique in the columns as they are right now. Um, so, so, but those are those are the two key components: is knowing what that program is and what it could lead to. Um, so, just just so you're aware. And the the what it could lead to, Heather, could have multiple correct answers, correct? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So you could have the one for program, example, and you could say it's an associate's degree, or they could give a certificate, or you know, so however however that is. Perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is actually a perfect example of that where where there are lots of options for what it could lead to. So, okay, great. Um, let's go on to career exploration. This is our last section. And, and Michael, we talked about this at the beginning. I'll just answer your question real quickly. Our hope, um, the IWES team is, is really prioritized this project. Our hope is it's open around the start of the school year for next year. So there are some slides earlier in the slide deck. Um, maybe, I don't know if, if Bill, Ben, Shavina, or Rodrigo can redrop the link into the chat for the slide deck. That would be awesome. Um, but yeah, there are a, some slides about that. Sorry, Jason. I should have a time frame at the end of this month. Um, I meet I meet with them twice a week um, to go through the different, um, you know, the different programming issues that we're having or, or things like that to clarify things and what components do we need to have. 
So they're actually putting it into kind of a mock production next week. Um, and so from that and, and starting the coding of it all, um, they'll, they'll give me a time frame for release and testing, um, hopefully at the end of the month. Great. Um, great question from, uh, it's just above Juan Jose's uh, quick plug that he dropped in. Uh, Heather, there's a question from Carrie in the chat. Um, if you can answer that question, that would be awesome. Um, I think you should be able to um, put both of them in there as long as they are tied to that program under the system resources. Uh, so I can double check that, Carrie, but I'm, I'm, you should be able to, to add both of those and not have to add them twice. But I will, I will double check it. Sometimes okay, it works. So sometimes just let me know, doesn't. Heather, because I did it <laughs> yesterday, actually. And okay. when I went back in, I tried to redo it with the institution and create both so that when the drop down came, it would offer it. Yeah. And right. it still did it. So it did. let me okay. know. I will. Yep. Um, this is our last section. So we will probably go just a few minutes over. Um, Bill hopefully can drop the link to the evaluation in if you do need to head out, if you can at least give us that evaluation feedback so we can look through that, that would be awesome. But in the meantime, um, we are gonna go into the career exploration section here, which is the last section. Um, and a lot of this focuses on actually the career exploration activities. Um, and so these are the really high quality ones. Um, what, what Heather has expressed is they, they have one, at least one, they may have more than one, they may have two or three of these, um, that there's opportunities for students to reflect and, and do some processing. Um, there's direct connection to content and skills that students are learning in a class. So like it is, it is not just a random field trip, whoever wants to can sign up. We are going as a class, it is almost more of a research trip than a field trip. Um, or opportunities for students to really dive deeper, either in their interactions with uh, an individual or multiple individuals in that pathway or in the work environment. And so, so just the career fair where we walk around and look at tables um, and, it's, it's, and it's devoid of these three things and it cuts across all seven pathways, um, that probably wouldn't do it. But if it does one of these three things, that really elevates that experience. Um, and that's that's what I understand is be to be looking for. And so, Heather, before I go on, any comments you want to make about this? Um, no, that that is exactly correct. So I put some comments on the feedback form when uh, they they put in these types of exploration activities, um, and just asking to specify: is there any kind of feedback? Is there is there any kind of um, ranking that the students have um, to be able to use one of those as your career exploration, that, that it goes beyond just, as Jason mentioned, walking around and looking at careers. So what type of feedback are, are they giving um, within? And that goes the same within some of the online programs that we have, like the Zello or the Naviance and so forth, knowing um, addressing the, that, that issue that the students are then determining which career they're interested in. That would be absolutely acceptable for one of those career exploration activities. And, and a lot of times what I'm seeing is even when I'm reading the course descriptions, the, the job shadowing and the site visits and so forth are happening in the class and use that then for those career explorations and identify what course that that's happening in because that helps with your data collection down the line when next month when we talk about how to identify if the student is eligible for the endorsement. Now you know because they've taken that class. So here are some examples of these really high quality ones. Um, that meet at least one of those, those three things on the last slide. So um, we're, we're leaving these um, with you. So, so if, you, if you do these things, you can see the language here, um, how it connects. And so we'll call out um, the class field trip. It's pretty cut and dry. It's to a career pathway specific site business organization with opportunities to learn about the career and the workplace. Obviously, if, if you know where they're going and can put that in, that's, that makes this even stronger. Um, same with this one for the career speakers. 
Um, if you if you listed the partnerships, that's great. But here, this is not just one guest speaker. This is once a month they're visiting class. So that makes sense to not not necessarily list all of them. Um, again, it's it's striking that right balance and really cool school district policy here. Um, we we know school districts um, provide excuse days for students to do college visits, for example. Students have two excuse days to job shadow in the career pathway of interest. And then they have students have to produce some product from those days. Um, and it's it's a range of pretty student friendly uh, products from as simple as um, uh, you know, a, a conversation to a presentation to something they post online or, or put up at school to show show their classmates what they saw and what's going on out there. Um, so these are some things directly from Heather. I'll turn it over to her that, you know, she has seen in, in some documentation and, and not seen in other documentation that when she sees them, she's like, oh, easy. This, yeah, nails it. <laughs> and so Heather? Yeah, this pretty much summarizes what Jason had discussed before and what we talked about. Um, include, if we go back to the previous slide, include one thing you could add to those descriptions would be the inclusion of the course in which that takes place, if it does. I mean, oftentimes it's, you know, it could be the class field trip, for example, could be the entire ninth grade class or, or whatever that is. So just kind of draw that out. Again, that is for your benefit to be able to have that, that data monitoring so that they know, um, you know, where those are occurring, especially when it gets to the determination of if a student is eligible. Um, the potential partners, as Jason mentioned, if you know that, um, would be would be wonderful to have that there. That just broadens that experience. Um, it's specifically how that exploration activity connects to their career pathway. So having the activities in Zello, like I mentioned, is it's fine for them to do, but how does that then connect to this career pathway that you're building a plan for? Um, are they having to reflect on, on their decision um, of which career they like the best? Or are they having to do any kind of summative uh, statements on that? Um, and then also how they reflect, like I just said, on that activity. And then it's still in the same general category, but now moving all the way to the career development experience, the internship on the other side. Um, these are the questions that Heather identified that, um, that the most successful ones are the ones that are standing out as like, up, oh, nailed it, 100%, whatever, have the answers to these questions. Heather, comments about this? Sure. Uh, again, in the in the feedback form, I've broken this down on the on what the um, requirements are for a career development experience. So some of the things that um, I've seen um, specifically where, and even if you don't list the the specific industry partner, what type of uh, workplace are they going to be? I mean, so that that it links to that career pathway. Um, how are they being assessed? Um, some of those are answered within, if it's like the workplace experience course, I am seeing some um, descriptions of that course and how that functions, but specifically, how are they being assessed? Remember that there's that uh, requirement of, of a skills assessment for the career development experience with those, within those 60 hours, and then how is this, the school and community uh, collaborating to develop that assessment? How is that determined um, that those students will do that? And as far as the hours go with this one, keep in mind too that um, it, it is, you, they could do two experiences, but the minimum amount is 20 hours. So it could be a 20-40 split, it could be a 30-30 split. Um, so just, just keep that in mind as well. All right, last thing is a reminder. When you have made the updates, there is nothing in the system that tells Heather that, unfortunately. And so it's really important that you do this. And we've got the link right here. Um, this is a short form to uh, let, let Heather know, essentially. And then it also provides her with a spreadsheet of who finished these in, in what order, who did their updates in what order. And she can go through and do those. Um, and so this no different. This was up last month, but we really want to stress because we know there are there are lots of districts that are, are going in there have been in there this week and have made updates. There's been some really good conversations, great conversations I've had with people uh, in small groups or individually. And so when you've done those updates, please do not forget to um, to fill out this this really quick short form. That's what will help Heather know 
that she can, can dive back into your application and take another look at it. And again, the one thing I'll mention is, you know, use line breaks um, liberally to help break up your chunks for what you're answering. I think it makes it easier for you as you're, as you're putting it together to make sure you've every, got everything there. And I, I think it makes it easier for Heather to review that. Um, we, we can stick around and answer other questions. Um, we have dropped the evaluation form in, please answer that. We will get this video up and we'll send an email out with the link to the video and the link to the slides, as well as the link to the Career Pathways Virtual Trailheads um, with another episode going up. And so uh, we hope everybody has a great weekend and is able to enjoy some spring weather if you're in the Southern part of the state and some winter weather if you're in the Northern part of the state. So um, happy to hang on.